When you see me, what do you see? I mean, what do you really see? Can you tell if I'm living a meaningful life? And if so, how would you know? How would I know? Growing up about six hours due west from this stage, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a city known for its blue collar attitude and its sports teams, of course, I never really thought much about a meaningful life or certainly didn't think much about living one. Part of that is because at the age of 16, I found myself, after we lost our neighborhood home, sleeping in the hallway of a red brick building in the dead of winter where the hinges on the doors were wound so tight that the door just never seemed to close. And honest to goodness, I can tell you that that night air and that morning breeze, I thought they conspired every day to keep me guessing about how to keep myself from dealing with the elements. Well, the fact of the matter was is that I constantly had to remember also not to twist myself up into a pretzel so that when I went off to school the next day, I wasn't a wrinkled mess because then people would have discovered that I was homeless. And that certainly couldn't be. I just couldn't have that happen. So I did some of my best critical thinking and problem solving while I was in that hallway because I made some goals. I set some targets, things I needed to do every day. One of the things I needed to do first was I needed to make sure that I got my homework done because I was going to school every day. The second thing, though, that I needed to do was keep myself warm. The third was I had to eat. You know, cold and hunger do not go together. And then the final thing that I had to do was make sure that I and my belongings were safe. So every day before I left for school, I would take my belongings and tuck them up under this crawl space in the back of the stairs and pray that by the time I got back at the end of the day that my belongings were there and thank God for the most part they were. So it wasn't about a meaningful life. Essentially I was just surviving my day to day but let me tell you something about surviving. Surviving is exhausting. I mean it takes work to live every day concerned about how you're going to move about every moment. So I have to tell you, my emotions, my feelings, my disappointments, my fears were on high alert every single day. But I knew not to do that was problematic. I mean, I would possibly put myself in danger, not to, me, not to mention be judged. But that's how it is. Thank goodness, though, after a while, as time went on and I sort of got past that homeless period, I had to figure out what was next. Well, like possibly many of you, what was next was probably college or something else, or for me, it was to go to work. But I had this grandmother in my life. I don't know if any of you had a grandmother like mine, but let me just tell you, she was the most persuasive woman I've ever known. Now, she was one of 20 children herself, and she wanted to see me go to college. If I'm honest, and I try to be, I wasn't that interested in going to college. Uh, that wasn't something I wanted to go do, but, you know, that persuasive person I just told you about, she had a different idea. So, in order not to uh, displease her or do anything that might hurt her, I said, well, I need to at least look into college, and I did. And I looked into several universities, and I was a good student, not a great student, but a good student, and what ended up happening is I got in a lot of universities. But I chose one in particular. And so on this very hot, humid day in August, after graduating high school, I found myself on a 16-hour bus trip to Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee was the home of Fisk University, which is a historically black college that has a focus on musical heritage. It is a great institution. However, during that time, I also spent time on this Greyhound bus thinking about what I could be. 
And I thought I could be great. I mean, I saw myself on this great stage. Now, if you could imagine, I'm sitting on this Greyhound bus. I got a brown bag lunch. I got my foot locker tucked up under the bus. I got $100 in my pocket, and I'm dreaming about greatness. I'm dreaming that there's absolutely no hill I can't scale. So what did I do? Got on that bus, got to Nashville, said I was going to be something great, and guess what happened? Well, like most things, you have your ups and downs, but what I discovered after about three years is that I probably was not going to make it as a classical vocalist because that was my aim. Can you imagine, though, when I first left, this scrawny little kid who barely had hair going out to study classical music. Are you kidding me? I mean, most of my friends thought that was really insane, but the fact of the matter was I had dreams of being great, and I had dreams of being a better version of myself. I thought that that was my meaningful life about to happen. But after three years, I realized that um, that wasn't going to happen. I didn't have enough money. And most importantly, my confidence was waning. So if you can believe it, after three and a half years passed, that beginning of that fourth year, one semester from finishing my undergraduate degree, I left college. I left to marry my college sweetheart and start a family. I'm searching for this meaningful life. I haven't gotten there, obviously, yet. Because when I left, I found the road was pretty hard. Can you imagine those first early years of being a married couple and now starting a family? I did not have a college degree yet. It, the struggle was hard. And all the emotions that I felt, the ones that I felt when I didn't make it as a classical vocalist and the things that I felt when I was sleeping in that hallway and the things that I felt when I was trying to hide my emotions from everyone else, that was just not good at all for me. And it certainly didn't spell having a meaningful life. But I thought this new stage would be. And frankly, I'm here to say as time went on, although the struggle was hard in the beginning, I ended up getting to a place where my family started to come together and things started to happen for me. But my meaningful life was about to take a dramatic turn because on July 31st at 6 p.m., meaningful life vanished because I lost my oldest child, Kia Nicole Drake. And I can't tell you in the moment as I stand here today, how I felt when she took her last breath because I didn't think I was breathing either. You see, I didn't really understand how tied I was to my meaningful life without her in it because shortly thereafter, I'd never even thought about having a meaningful life after that. In fact, life had no meaning even though I had other children and I had a career, and there were a lot of good things that had happened, I still felt this was a turning point for me. And it was. Now, I searched for things to sort of help me through that period. I read more, I did more, but I realized that the only thing I could do was cry. And so my time was spent not just grieving, but just feeling as though there was no tomorrow until I actually believed that I could get with other men, black men, black fathers, who actually had lived through a similar experience. Six men helped me write a book to talk about and celebrate their children. And let me just say, it wasn't cathartic. It wasn't as if getting through the book actually helped us you know, get through the grief. It didn't. It hasn't even today as I stand here. But what it did do is it began to help me reshape 
what having a meaningful life was all about. You see, often for men, regardless of their race or culture, there is never a recognized intersection called vulnerability and courage. I actually want you to think about this equation. Vulnerability plus courage equals strength. I want to say it again. Vulnerability plus courage equals strength. Any men in this house, any men listening to the sound of my voice, know what it's like not to be able to release your emotions, not to be seen, not to be heard. It's a challenging time for us when that happens. And it happens more often than many people realize. You see, I would tell you that living a meaningful life, we have to discover our superpower. Our superpower, it's emotional fluency. It helps you discover your meaningful life. You know that roller coaster that I was on? Well, let me just tell you, you don't want a ticket to the roller coaster I was on. It's not one I would have bought. But since I was on it, the question is, what do I do with it? How do I navigate it? You remember that degree that I said I didn't finish, that I left undergraduate school and I was one semester short? Well, in, in May of this year, 46 years to the day that I would have graduated, and the week of my daughter's 46th birthday, she would have turned 46 this year, I got that degree. I got the degree because that was another part of being able to reshape my meaningful life. It was an opportunity for me to continue to progress, to go from that hallway when I was scared to death every day to a place that I call the beach. You see, metaphorically, a meaningless life is one that is stuck, but a meaningful life is one that flows. You know, roller coasters, when you watch them and you're standing on the ground and you're looking up at them, they flow. Well, guess what? Having a meaningful life means you have some flow. So here's what I'd leave you with. No matter what you do when you leave today, I would just encourage you to understand that your superpower is your ability to manage those emotions inside you. Those things that make life meaningful. Those things that give a flow to your daily existence. I believe that for me, having a meaningful life has been using my superpower. Emotional fluency is a superpower. I know I have it, and I believe you do too. And my advice, use it. Thank you.